Hey YouTube, Epidemic 2020 here again, and this time I'm here to talk to you about slavery in the Bible. Now this video is going to have a lot of information. I've seen a lot of people on YouTube say that the Bible advocates slavery. I think the Bible makes it very clear that slavery under the Mosaic Law and slavery we know today are totally different things. But I've heard some atheists claim that biblical slaves were bought and sold, that they did not have equal rights, that their daughters could be sold as sex slaves, that it was okay to beat your slaves, and that God does not oppose the injustice of slavery. So I'm going to address these issues and a couple more. I'll start with what I believe. I believe that biblical slavery does not involve slave traders or view slaves as inferior. A person becomes a slave if they are unable to pay a debt. The slaves have the same right as their masters, and it was really just a difference in economic status. And if you don't have to take my word for it, I'm going to show you some evidence. So let's see what the Bible has to say. Starting in Deuteronomy 15:12. If a fellow Hebrew, a man or woman, sells himself to you and serves six years, in the seventh year, you must let him go free. He sells himself to you. Yep, that's what it says. So he sells himself. But to be fair, that verse doesn't say anything about slave traders. But these next few verses do. If we take a look at Exodus 21.16, it says, Anyone who kidnaps another and sells him, or still has him when he is caught, must be put to death. So if you're a slave trader, you get put to death. And Deuteronomy 24, 7, if a man is caught kidnapping one of his brother Israelites and treats him as a slave or sells him, the kidnapper must die. You must purge the evil from among you. So this verse repeats that if you are a slave trader, you die. So it must be important. Not only does the law not allow the buying and selling of slaves, but you get put to death for it. So I would say it's pretty heavily discouraged. So now we're going to take a look at what the Bible says about the rights of slaves. Deuteronomy 16.12 Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and follow carefully these decrees. Now, this verse shows us that the Israelites knew what it was like to be true slaves and they did not model that behavior. The slaves actually had feasts and days off just like all the rest of the people. Deuteronomy 15.12-14 In the seventh year you must let him go free and when you release him, do not send him away empty-handed. Supply him liberally from your flock. So, this verse is saying that it's about the year of Jubilee and their debt would be pardoned on the seventh year. This also helps us realize that they were not sold into slavery but became slaves because of their debt. It also shows us that their masters were very kind to them. So now let's look at Exodus 23.9. Do not oppress an alien. You yourselves know how it feels to be aliens because you were aliens in the land of Egypt. So this makes a distinction between the oppressive slavery in Egypt <coughs> and the slavery seen in Israel. Leviticus 19.34 says, The alien living among you must be treated as one of your native born. Love him as yourself. You are aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So here we're supposed to treat him as a native born and love him as yourself. That's not even reminiscent of the slavery we know today. So now let's talk about lifelong slavery. As mentioned earlier, if an Israelite took another Israelite as a slave, it would be pardoned seven years later. An Israelite only became a slave for life if he wanted to. And this is seen in Deuteronomy 15, verses 16 and 17. Uh, but if your servant says to you, I do not want to leave you because he loves you and your family is well, loves you and your family and is well off with you, then take an awl and push it through his earlobe to the door and he will become your servant for life. Do the same for your mate servant. So this is clearly a choice. If you want to stay, you can. And if you don't, you can leave. So now I'm going to check out Leviticus 25 verses 44 and 46 because these verses are probably misinterpreted the most often. Now this verse de deals with slaves coming from foreign nations and the only real difference between those slaves and the Israelite slaves is that the year of Jubilee did not apply to them. The year of Jubilee was a cultural perk for the Israelites. So Leviticus 25 44. Your male and female slaves are to come from the nations around you. From them you may buy slaves. This verse is describing the same type of slavery used on the fellow Israelites. We know this because the King James Version explains that fairly clearly. And in this verse, people were not buying slaves from traders. The money goes to the person selling himself into slavery or goes to pay off his debt. Now, Leviticus 25 verse 46. You can will them to your children as intellectual property and make them slaves for life. Since the year of Jubilee does not occur, 
Foreigners' debts were not pardoned every seven years. They could serve for longer periods, and they could even serve for their natural life as slaves. It was not always lifelong, it just depended on the amount of debt. Now let's look at the supposed sex slaves. Uh, Exodus 21, 7-11 If a man sells his daughter as a servant, she is not to go free as men servants do. If she does not please the master who has selected her for himself, he must let her be redeemed. He has no right to sell her to foreigners because he has broken faith there. If he selects her for his son, he must grant her the rights of a daughter. If he marries another woman, he must not deprive the first one of the food, clothing, and, material, and marital rights. If he does not provide her with these three things, she is to go free, without any payment of money. So, if it's difficult to understand a verse, sometimes you can look at multiple translations. Since they were all translated from the same source, reading multiple translations just helps you to get a better understanding of what the text is trying to say. So let's check out this verse in King James. If she please not her master, who hath betrothed her to himself, then sh shall he let her be redeemed. To sell her unto a strange nation, he shall have no power, seeing he hath dealt deceitfully with her. So, what does betrothed mean? It means engaged to be married, not to be confused with sex slave. Uh, during this time, there was marriage contracts and bride prices and arranged marriages. So I'm going to go ahead and interpret these verses for you now. And you can read along if you want to. So, if a father receives a bride price for his daughter, and she signs a marriage contract with the man, and the two of them don't get along, the daughter can be returned and the bride price refunded. If she is engaged to the man's son, then the man has an obligation to treat her as his own daughter. If she is engaged to the man, and he decides to marry someone else, then he still has to pay for all the girl's food, clothing, and living expenses, or she is returned to his father and they get to keep the bride price. Furthermore, the Bible is very clear that you can't have sex before marriage. So the idea of having sex slaves is kind of ridiculous. Uh, now let's look at God's supposed instructions on how to beat your slaves to death. Alright, Exodus 21.20 20. If a man beats his male or female slave with a rod and the slave dies as a direct result, he must be punished. Now, if we look at Deuteronomy 19.21, we can see exactly what this punishment is. Show no pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So the punishment of beating your slave is death. Now let's look at verse oh, Exodus 21.21. 21. But he is not to be punished if the slave gets up after a day or two, since the slave is his property. So what that's saying is that if you don't end up killing your slave and he gets up and he lives, then you're not punished by death. But what you are punished by is seen in Exodus 21, 27. And if he knocks out the tooth of a manservant or maidservant, he must, be let, he must let the servant go free to compensate for the tooth. So if there's ever any serious injury to a slave, then the slave gets to go free and is pardoned of his debt. Now to see what God really thinks about slavery, we can check out Deuteronomy 23, 15-16. And this says, if a slave has taken refuge with you, do not hand him over to his master. Let him live among you, whatever he likes, and in whatever town he chooses. Do not oppress him. So what this is saying is that God does not advocate oppressive slavery by returning the slave to their captors. Instead, he gives them free refuge. Now, God has opposed the unfair treatment of individuals in the Old Testament. In Egypt, he punished them with the ten plagues for the wrongful captivity and abuse of the Jews. The New Testament also takes a stance against slavery by commanding that we do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, and that we love our neighbor as ourselves. Christian teachings simply do not support the injustices of slavery. So remember, God loves you, and so do I.